Um, can you hear me okay? Hopefully. Um, so, uh, um, as as uh, was mentioned, I'm I'm a family doctor in uh, a smaller town, um, and uh, have been here for about forty years now. So I'm the white hair guy, and um, and I've been doing palliative care for about thirty five years. Um, and I just want to tell a little story about uh, about um, how things have happened uh, in in uh, in my life and how things have. Uh, sort of progressed in in the care of the palliative patients. Um, my wife, in, in fact, is involved in palliative care of pediatric patients as she uh, um, worked uh, with um, Dr. DeWeber in uh, in London in pediatrics, um, and uh, and and I started off with uh, Dr. John Scott at St. Mike's. Um, it's uh, the what interested me first in palliative care uh, was um, which, and I think a lot of people who do palliative care as a as a work have had experiences in their lives which have touched them enough to bring them into palliative care. Um, my when uh, just after we got married and we'd worked in St. Lucia for a year doing some palliative, uh, doing some some. Uh, um, post uh, tornado work down in, in the islands. Um, I, when we came, got back, um, my father was uh, diagnosed with, uh, with lung cancer at the age of 64. He'd been a very healthy man and he quickly uh, declined and uh, was uh, essentially at the end treated in a major hospital. And, um, and um, and was treated physically, but not not really the the way that we would treat people in palliative care. And he he quickly declined and uh, became very short of breath and had lots of pain, and essentially died with very very um, difficult situations, which was distressing for all of us in the family. My mother, a year and a half later as she um, just got back from Italy when she was uh, visiting her, her mother, um, at the age of 61, was um, diagnosed with ovarian cancer. And, um, and she went through some chemotherapy and Debbie, my wife, was looking after her as I was doing some, some uh, anesthesia, care, anesthesia study in, uh, in London. And and the care that Debbie gave her and my and my uh, and her my mother's sisters, um, you know, allowed her to actually um, stay at home, to be cared for, to be loved. Um, the 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 pain control wasn't necessarily all the greatest, but on the other hand, the social and the emotional and the personal care was exemplary. And my mother, as I remember her when she passed away, that last day, I can remember she was sitting up and just pull, pulling herself up in bed and looking at us. And her eyes were translucent, just like she was looking through the door where she was going. And you could see the love coming out of her. And, and her death was a spiritual affair, affair for all of us. And it was it was something which which really moved us to move me anyway into the thought of being able to care for patients, um, care for patients at the end of life, and and help them have a situation similar like my mother's. So in 1986, I went in to do I I did palliative care uh, work with Elizabeth Latimer, who was um, who's now passed away but was taught by Cicely Saunders and Belfer Mount, who were the, you know, big names in palliative care in Britain and in Canada. And, um, and I learned through her that uh, many aspects of symptom, of the symptoms related to end of life, um, weren't just symptoms of pain, but, but 
but we, we, we had to embody the spirit of caring the whole person, body, mind, and spirit. Much of the teaching uh, was deeply touched my heart as, I, as, I, um, as it led me into a place of not only having the knowledge and skill of, of, of taking care of these patients, but also put me in a place of compassion and empathy. And, and she, as she said, compassion is like carrying someone's suffering. It's not like leading them through um, her, their disease, but walking with them and caring for them and making sure that you're doing not only the best for their physical, but also for their emotional, spiritual needs. And as, um, as was mentioned last, uh, session, um, you know, Dr. Chachanov and, and Elizabeth Latimer um, told us that, that it is time to listen to other stories and to allow us as caregivers to create a safe place for the patient. They understand that, um, they understood that when we remove the, our, our coat and sit at the, at the bedside with the patient, that, the pers that we're seeing the person uh, who is ill and dying, not as a disease, not as, uh, as their own personal suffering, but as, as someone who may be broken, fearful, having many losses, missing and possibly missing the, the, the future with their family. And we can imagine the fear and the intolerable pain and the nausea, rapid weight loss, and looking not at, at all like themselves and, and losing all the things that they might want to celebrate like birthdays and, and births of their grandchildren and Christmas and all those things. And what we need to do is to, and what we've, what Thomas has said, is that, you know, we need to honor these, these, uh, these patients. We don't need to, um, we need to treat their pain, their, their suffering, but we also need to walk hand in hand with them, giving them support along the way. Um, I, I just maybe give you some examples uh, of the different dimensions of palliative care. Years ago, we were looking after a pastor um, uh, from an evangelical church who was dying of cancer, and we were able to manage his pain and control his, his uh, nausea through medications. As a result, he was able to manage at home with the help of his loving family um, who were grieving even before he died and, and the community nurses that were helping him. And he also was able to support his family and us through his disease with spiritual and emotional care. And when he died, Deb and I went down to his, to his home and we were so warmly invited into his, his house. And while we were waiting for the funeral, vehicle to come, we, um, we spent time with the family celebrating in his kindness, his stories, and the family shared with, that the family shared with us. And we held and were held by the spirit of the family that was around us. In another instance, recently a young lady in hospital was um, with a digestive cancer, who was unable to swallow or eat, um, but was very young in her 50s and her daughter was having a child actually this month. And all she wanted to do was to be there. She wasn't so worried about her own suffering, but she just wanted the joy of being there with her family. When, when she was passing away. So what we did was something which we normally wouldn't do. Um, we, we talked about how we could support her on her journey until, you know, things, uh, until her daughter had her child. Um, 
we allowed her to have uh, intravenous um, fluids and intravenous feeding. And within a couple of days, she was feeling much better and was able to go home and spend time with her family. And just the last, in the last few days, I called her up and said, how are things going? And she said, my granddaughter's born. I was there. I loved it. It was so wonderful. Thank you for allowing me to be there. That was the biggest thing that could happen in my life. It wasn't so much the suffering that we, uh, the physical suffering that we were treating, but the emotional and the spiritual suffering that she needed, that, that she needed treating. And we, we were able to do that in a very special way for her. And, um, and, she, and it, it not only brought joy to her, but brought joy to all of the people that were looking after her. The other side of the coin though was happened not too long ago either was a, an elderly lady who had been looking after for quite a long time. And for some reason she went into the hospital um, I'd been away for a bit, and when I got back, I, um, I, I had heard that she was asking for maid. This really shocked me because we had, we had had a, this um, conversation before, and we'd done a lot of talking about it, and, and I thought, oh man, I really have to go in and see how she's doing, what's going on, so I, I went to, to, to her bedside and sat with her, and and we talked about how she was doing and, and, um, and what, her, what, um, what her suffering was like. And we discussed um, what things that we could do for her, her. And I said, listen, we can give you some more, some different medication. We can try certain things that will make you feel better and, and, uh, and have you there with your family. And she cried and said to, to me, you know, I, I, Asked, uh, I was asked if, if I wanted made, and I thought, man, this would be the best thing for me right now. And I'm so glad that you came to talk to me about it because it's, it's against my spiritual, spirituality to, to, you know, to uh, commit suicide or to be, to be euthanized. And it just makes me so much happier to understand that you will look after me and that you'll take care of me and that you will, you'll be with me. And she, um, and she lived for a few more weeks and died peacefully with her family in the hospital. The hospital is not necessarily the best place for people to die, but they do get such great care, especially in the palliative care units or in the in, um, in the uh, geriatric units where the care is exemplary. Certainly a painful suffering can be the cause for someone to ask for a swift, a swift death. Yet with skillful treatment and care through palliation, suffering can be diminished and the patient and the family can hold on and preserve the love that they have and they share for other, with each other. And we help patients live until they die naturally and support the loved ones as well. In our, in our hospital, uh, every year we have a celebration of life for all the patients who have died um, in our palliative care unit and in other, in other units who we've looked after. And we, offer, we send them um, cards and bring them into our... Um, into our large uh, um, uh, uh, cafeteria. And uh, we talk to them and we pray with them. And they are so appreciative of the care that they've been given um, and, the and the wealth of joy that they got for looking after their families. I must say that one or two of the cases of MAID that I've um, that I've uh, had, um, not that I've been in, uh, uh, in care of the patient at that time, but that I've heard of from my own patients and in my family practice, 
some of those can be very traumatic for the families. And I think that the people that are, are, that are asking for me don't realize how difficult it is for their families to, um, to work through that process. I think it can be very, very traumatic, particularly if they're asked to be there at the time. So I think we have to be careful um, about how we talk to patients, how we are with patients, and how, and as Thomas said, the more that we give them support, the more that we give them love, the more that we are with them along their journey, the better they're going to feel and the better their death will be. Thank you.